A cinematographer is a man who must have a great visual concept of what filming is all about. Specifically, his function is to photograph, and in order to photograph, he must first have an idea or, or an interpretation, shall I say, of what the writer is writing. The same as a composer of music writes music, and the conductor translates that in terms of organized sounds. Organized sounds the key. The cinematographer, to be more specific and to, to be able to have the audience understand it better, is one who creates a mood, who creates a style photographically, and who has to have a knowledge of what the society of today is all about, as the society was 20 years ago, 50 years ago, and in the future. Welcome to Talking Film. One element of a motion picture that is frequently discussed yet seldom studied is the art and craft of the cinematographer. Our program attempts to explore the men who photograph motion pictures, the cinematographers. While our concern here is not so much for the purely technical side of their craft, it is an examination of some of the pictures they photographed as well as their relationships with directors and actors. We've selected four eminent cinematographers. Lee Garms, whose credits include Morocco and Detective Story. Stanley Cortez, who photographed the magnificent Ambersons in The Night of the Hunter. Haskell Wexler, who shot One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and who won an Oscar for Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf and another for Bound for Glory. And last but not least, Victor Kemper, whose credits include Dog Day Afternoon, as well as Elliot Kazan's production of The Last Tycoon. Lee Garms and Stanley Cortez date from the 20s and 30s, while Haskell Wexler and Victor Kemper, they're of the new breed. Here, then, are four cinematographers talking film. It's interesting. A cinematographer is a, kind of a fancy name for a cameraman who has the additional responsibility over and above uh, what you might do in newsreel or, or commercials of uh, specifically helping the director so that he can be free to work with the talent and you take the responsibility of setting the shots, selecting the equipment, picking the lens, camera position, the move, and doing the lighting for every setup. But you see yourself as, as an aid to him, don't you, the Absolutely. director? You don't see yourself as apart from the director. Oh, no. No, no. I mean, you could function apart from the director, but after all, the, in feature films at least, the picture is the director and the director is the picture. I like to conceive it that way. Some people feel that it's not. But when it's finally on the screen and the director gets the credit for it, the overall concepts as they were executed are his responsibility. Even though someone else, the writer, had put them down first, the visual aspect of it, the way the actors behave in it, and the way it looks, even though the look is mine to execute, it is the director's responsibility to to supervise and see that it fits the overall pattern. It is not the cameraman or the cinematographer's job to oversee the whole film. He has nothing to do with the editing. That's he's true. Cu he's cut off at the end when, uh, when someone says, well, that's our last shot wrap, and we all congratulate each other. The cameraman has little else to do with that picture, except hope that it's good. And it's a part of the filmmaking that upsets me because I feel cut off at that point. You put in months of work and, and you hope that it looks great. And you know that cutting can change your point of view, and it often does. And you have no control over it whatsoever. So it is the director in the end who has total control over the way the film looks on the screen, even though he may not have total control while it's being shot. No matter what I do, no matter what any of us in my particular category or profession do, we do in conjunction with the knowledge of the, the motion picture director. This has to be a team. If there is no team, we're in trouble. Uh, 
But once we discuss this with the director, we're on our own. And any cinematographer who's worth his salt can go out and should go out and take complete charge in order to execute that which was previously discussed in terms of a, of a, of a conversation with, with the um, director and the producer. I got along very well with, uh, with uh, von Sternberg. Um, in fact, uh, <clears throat> Morocco was our first picture together, and that was supposed to be uh, Gary Cooper's first starring vehicle, and also Marlene Dietrich's first starring vehicle as far as America's concerned. She had made about 30 pictures in Germany before. Uh, Blue Angel was one, of course, that von Sternberg had made with her in, in, in Germany. But um, if you ever see the picture, the first, the opening of the scenes, um, I had lit her side light, half tones, with one half her face light and the other half dark. And of course, in those days, we used to see the rushes the next day at noon. So I had photographed her for a day and a half. I went in to see the rushes, and I said to myself, I said, Lee Garms, you've got to change your lighting because you've got another Greta Garbo on the screen, and we can't have two Greta Garbos because Bill Daniels lights Greta Garbo that way, and you can't light Dietrich that way. You've got to go back to your old style of um, Rembrandt or the North Lights, so I did from that time on. Uh, he was very photographic minded, and uh, all of his sets that he built and designed with the art director were all so that he'd be very interested photographically. After all, he was a motion picture filmmaker, and there are very few that are that way. Howard Hawks was a motion picture filmmaker. They realized that, uh, that what went through that camera had to be interesting, not only light-wise, photographic-wise, but also with talk or the scenes or actors and so forth. And that's right. That's what the medium is. You know, uh, when you look at it, of all the arts that have gone on in the world through time, that the motion picture is really the newest form of real art that we have. And we're just commencing with it, really. It's just, just commencing. We were at the same studio with Orson, by we I mean I was with David Selting at the time. And uh, I used to go to New York for David and, and do these very secretive tests for him back there. Uh, prior to my leaving for New York, I uh, had a chat with Jack Moss, the... Uh, his business manager, wasn't yes, he? Yes, uh, he was the business manager, as well as a, a sort of a, 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 a confidant, shall I say, of Orson. And, uh, I asked him, I said, Jack, I said, uh, who is Orson having for his cinematography? He said, well, we're going to use uh, an RKO man. I said, great, they have some very good men there. Now, all this time, I would go around the various stages and see the sets going up for the Magnificent Ambersons. And I'd say to myself, my God, I pity the poor chap that has to photograph this. Now we dissolve. I went back to New York and... Uh, Lo and behold, I'm there for three or four days with George Cukor doing some very extensive tests back there, one of which was Mr. Gregory Peck. And the phone call comes from Jack Moss that Orson wants me to do Magnificent Ambersons. Could I leave New York immediately? I said, I don't know. I must talk with Mr. Sosnick first. Well, to make a long story short, I finally talked with David. And over the phone, we agreed that I would go back to Hollywood, which I did. I left... Uh, New York on a Sunday night. I arrived here on a Monday evening, went directly right to the studio, and I met Orson Welles for the first time in my life on a Monday night, and we start shooting Tuesday morning. It's impossible. Tuesday morning. That's amazing, amazing. And the first sequence was that you mentioned before, Elvie, which is the long table. In which Cotton discourses on the right. automobile impact in America. That was the opening sequence. One of the great scenes of the picture. Right. Yeah. And I don't mind telling you, I was a bit on edge. I didn't know Watson too well. I never saw him before. Uh, I never met him before in my whole life. Anyway, uh, as happens on a thing like that, I made a few changes the night before. That is, uh, lighting changes and uh, things like that. And as time went on, the next morning I went to the laboratory and uh, I saw the film in negative form. And I knew that Austin would like what I had to show him. And he did. He threw his arms around me, and we became like that, which is what it should be. 
oh, your yeah. biggest memory from, from that experience? Uh, getting fired. Getting fired <laughs> by Milos Forman. <laughs> yeah, Did right. you do it personally? <laughs> Uh, reluctantly, but personally, it was, he said to me, um, uh, Haskell, you know, um, <laughs> uh, when I went to him, it was at, like, after mid, in the first place, I was just sort of notified, this is after five and a half weeks of work, uh, where everything looked terrific and everybody was happy, um, uh, and they, I don't know if you're interested in the details. Yes, I am. I'm okay. fascinated by them, uh, Haskell. The uh, Michael Douglas and Saul Zantz, who were very friendly to me at all times, and I to them, because I, I mean, I liked them, uh, called me after a long day shooting, and it was about 9 o'clock at night, and said, well, uh, we're, you're going to have to, you can't finish the picture. And um, so I said, well, I thought they were joking. Yeah, said, yeah. So, uh, because I'd worked in everything. I worked in the script. I, I worked with Jack Nicholson. I, I had... Um, it was, it was partly my picture. You must have been flabbergasted. Yeah, I was, yeah, and, and I worked very hard. So, um, so I said, well, we're, why am I fired? Well, you have, there are certain basic disagreements between you and the director. So I said, well, where is the director? I mean, if, I, mean I talk to him every day. I sit there and see dailies for two and a half hours every night. I mean, how, how can that be? So uh, they said, well, they're, they're sorry, but that's the way it is. So I insisted see Milos. So yes. Michael Douglas rode, uh, drove me out as I followed him out to this big house that Milos had rented. And, uh, and it's about midnight by that point. And I, and I went in to see Milos. And I, and I said, Milos, what the hell is this? Yeah. There, there. So he said, uh, he says, what can I say? So I said, well, you can say it's a lot of bull. You know, I mean, it, it, I mean, what is this that I disagree with you? I mean, I've been working with you on this film. And obviously, we're working for the same thing. He said, uh, uh, he, says, I don't, he says, I don't know. He says, uh, he says, look, at, he says, when this is all over, we can talk about it. I said, Milos, well, they're talking about me being, being fired. I mean, do we have a disagreement? If so, what is the disagreement? And we'll discuss it. And that's, so he, he wouldn't say. He didn't say. He just, he just said, um, uh, he was very nice. I mean, his manner and demeanor was, I mean, it was fantastically nice. And he just said, uh, uh, when someday when this is all over, we'll have to talk. Just couldn't tell no. you directly. No. Now, did he ever have that talk with you when it was all never, over? Never. Did you ever really find out what the problem? Never. I read different. Uh, there's always something different in some magazine saying that uh, that I wanted to make it more of a documentary, or that uh, that I uh, that I lit so that the actors were couldn't move and he couldn't stand that, which is all not so at all. Because that, that 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 set was generally lit with windows and top lights, so actors could go anywhere they wanted. Like Alice in Wonderland, the story gets curiouser and curiouser, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it was very, I mean, I'm joking now and smiling, but it was very upsetting. And uh, even in talking about it now, I, I still feel that upset. I can tell. I can tell. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Willie was wonderful. I got a wonderful, wonderful rapport with Willie Wilder. Um, I know when he was preparing to do... Um, uh, the detective story, <clears throat> I was making a film at Columbia. So I'd finish my work at Columbia and look at the rushes and, and come over and talk with Willie to prepare because they were going to start pretty quickly. And I know one time I worked with Willie and I said, um, try to find a stage that has nice smooth floors. And I said, if you find any floors that are not smooth, have them sand them and have them fill them up with uh, putty or something. He said, why? I said, I'm going to use the crab dolly. He said, what's the crab dolly? So I explained to him what the crab dolly was. He said, you mean I went to lay dolly track? I said, no, not at all, Willie. So I know I fixed my lights so he had all the room in the world. And he just thought I was a genius. And we started shooting. And I, I said, I would like to suggest to you that you rehearse the picture for a couple of weeks. He says, OK, I'll do that. And he said, in fact, I'm going to do even better. He said, I'm going to have um, um, uh, Doug, uh, uh, the man, leading man, um, Kirk Douglas, uh, go down to Phoenix and play the part in a stage play for two weeks, which he did. So he got boned up on the part. And then, of course, many of our actors that were in it were, had been in a stage play. So what we did, we rehearsed for two weeks. And then the last couple of days, we brought a still cameraman in and took stills of every setup. And then we took a piece of the script and put the picture below it so that the text went with the picture. 
and that helped us. And then by me pre-lighting, uh, it was in three sequences, one late afternoon, one evening, and one around midnight. And I could uh, have that all arranged with switches in the back of the set. Had a very good gaffer, so we could switch from one type of lighting to another very simply. And uh, so I said, Willie, if uh, you rehearse the picture, uh, we can do it in a hurry. He went, he went to me, but the first day he said to me, do you think we can make this picture in 36 days? I said, Billy, don't ask me that. You ask yourself that. I said, uh, if you've got a good script and you're not going to keep changing it, I said, we can make this picture in 20 days if you want to make it. Uh, and what finally said, happened? Well, we finally made it in, in, uh, in um, we had 36 days. We made it in 30 days. So when the picture was finished, oh, I meant to say <clears throat> that the first day shooting we shot, we, were, we had two days' work we shot. So each day we had two days' work that we shot. So at the end of the first week, we were six days at that time. At the end of the first six days, the first week, we were six days ahead of schedule. So he got a little bit, uh, uh, he said, oh, we've gone far enough, that's enough. So anyway, we finished the picture in 30 days. Well, about three or four days later, I was passing his office, and he rapped in the window for me to come in. So I came into his office, and he said, look at these sheets here. I looked at him. He said, we didn't save any money by shooting in 30 days. I said, how come? He said, well, we saved. The only money we saved is was on the crew for the, 30 day, for, the, for the six more days. He said, you were on a flat for so much for the picture. I was. And he said, the sets cost so much money. The actors are all on so much. So he said, we only saved a few thousand dollars by doing it. We, he said, we could have gone over a week or two weeks. We wouldn't have, wouldn't have cost any money. Charles was a great student, by the way, of Griffith, David Walk Griffith. And I believe the influence of Griffith was very strong on the, in the thinking of, of Charles and also the Knight of the Hunter. Uh, I would come to Charles's house quite often to explain to Charles some of the techniques, that is to say camera-wise, so that he would get a better, uh, a better idea of, uh, of lenses and what they could do and what they could not do, so that I would sort of brief him on, on many things. But the oddity about that briefing was that instead of me briefing him, I became the student and he the professor. Really? <laughs> yes. A great brain, a great man, and a great artist. There was one sequence in the film there where Bob Mitchum, a great artist, by the way, and who in Charles's thoughts uh, was a great poet, as, a, as an artist, as, a, as an actor and artist. There's a sequence in there where um, Bob is about to murder Shelley Winters. And as you know, uh, Bob plays the part of a phony priest, the high collar and all, and the love and hate thing and all that. And uh, in overplaying the, the, the character, it was intentional because of the phony priest. But in that sequence there, uh, in preparing the scene, that is to say, lighting-wise and camera-wise, and to repeat, Charles and I enjoyed a very fine relationship, as it must always be, between director and cinematographer. And in going through my, my ordeal of trying to create something with light in terms of cinematic, uh, he would ask me, he said, uh, Cortez, in his own way, what in hell are you thinking about? And I would say, Lawton, none of your goddamn business. Of course, in a, in a loving and, and respectful way. But he insisted. And so I explained to him, I said, Charles, to be quite frank with you, I'm thinking about a certain piece of music. And he said, pray may I ask what the music is? I said, Jan Sibelius's Valse Triste. Ah. And his face turned white. He said, my God, how right you are, Stan. This whole sequence needs a waltz tempo. And would you believe it, he sent for the composer, Walter Schumann, who came on the set to see what we were doing visually in terms of light so he can interpret that in terms of musical forms. Another interesting phase about Three Phases of V, which few people know about, and which ties into the relationship of director and cinematographer, not only Johnson, who is and was and will always be a great writer and a great director. Uh, when I was first assigned to the picture, I was asked by Nunnally to devise a scheme or some idea or some photographic concept of the difference between character A, B, and C, which was the integral part of the film. 
and a very important part, as you can remember. Well, I went home with a script, studied it, and I came back the next day and I said, Nunley, I think we're all wrong in thinking in terms of some mechanical device to transpose A, B, and C, that is characters one, two, and three. He said, what do you mean? I said, Nunley, it has to, I, I said, I can give you all kinds of ideas, technically speaking and photographically, but none could surpass what could and must come from within this girl. He said, what do you mean? And I explain. I said, no matter what I do, must be subservient to her. It must come from the heart. He said, by God, you're right, but how do we do it? He came up with the answer, not I. It was a simple trick of the theater. I shouldn't say trick, but a, a, a method or a technique. If you remember the picture, she goes from one character to the second and to the third. And by the mere putting the hand as I'm doing to you right now in front of the face, which in, in essence is curtain. The hand goes up, and when the hand comes down, it's character two. And the audience accepted as such. But with that change of character, by way of a simple hand, which is the curtain, I had devised a very subtle change of light, a change of light, which symbolized character A, B, and C. Dog Day, for the most part, was an all practical location picture. Even though the bank was constructed, it was constructed on a practical Brooklyn street. And uh, they took a street which was uh, closed up, not traffic-wise, but the storefronts were all boarded up. There were some gypsies living in the back. Uh, the area where we shot was a vacant automotive repair garage. And uh, the, street, the street was so empty that the company thought it would be an ideal spot to lay out the robbery area. So we built the bank in the automotive garage, put the gypsies in hotel rooms, and constructed the various storefronts that we needed. The barber shop, which figured heavily, it was the, yes. uh, the police the control, street. and yeah. the, uh, the pizza shop and the florist. Those things we put where we wanted them so that we had a shot from the bank to the barber shop and the barber shop to the bank which was, in fact, the way it was in reality. It, it was a very realistic structure then. So yeah. it then became an all-location picture. How did you work with Kazan, your relationship? Could you give us some insight into that? I suppose it must be different with each director, or is it largely the same? No, because, I um, mean, well, for what I change, and, and uh, then the directors change and the times change, but uh, that film, uh, looking back on it, Kazan was a very, uh, <clears throat> he was a very brave man because I had only done one feature, and um, I was not an experienced cameraman. And he was Mr. Kazan, who was an established director and actually a brilliant man. Yeah, excellent, and, excellent. And, um, so, but that didn't stop me from being very. Um, aggressive and feisty and opinionated <laughs> <laughs> and I think that we went to it a few times and looking back at it I think it was that was uh, uh, very presumptuous on my part is the depth of the man is so great that everyone feels it on the set and the actors respond to it and he directs quietly takes them aside doesn't keep there, there's always there's there's an automatic discipline on the set when he's there either because of who he is or what he is or maybe the way he treats people. He treats everyone with respect. And he knows everyone on the crew, you know, way early in the picture. Just knows everyone by first name. And it gives, a, it gives you a feeling of camaraderie and, and like you've always been together. And I, I think his personality leads itself to, uh, to discipline somehow. And then his knowledge just comes out in the way he directs. And it's just easy to work with him because he always, almost always has an idea that works first time. And he, it's easy, seems easy for him to convey that to the actors. And all I have to do is pay attention and, I, and it works for me too. I think Bob Rafelson has, um, uh, has a plan, a preconceived plan that he sticks to. And that's not to say that he's not flexible, and not, that if something interesting happens on a location that would benefit the film, that he wouldn't use it. 
but he tended to plan a little more and use uh, and stick to his plan, whereas Cassavetes almost always improvises. That can be costly, of course. It's a more expensive picture, isn't it, when you improvise? If you do it all the time, it is. But then again, you also get things that you don't always get if you stick right to the book. Some of the biggest, and I include Robert Mitchum and George Scott, among the biggest, they really don't seem to care about, they, they don't do the thing with the lights, and, and uh, they're not always noticing where the camera is unless it affects a specific performance. They have that ability to come on the set and do what was rehearsed and asked of them and do it well, and never seem conscious of what's around them. And then there are the others who are so paranoid about the way they look that they're always worried about where their key light is or how high is the camera because I got this thing under my chin and I don't. <laughs> and I can understand it because they get upset if they see themselves on the screen and they look like other than they think they should. They get very upset and they can't perform the following day. Maybe that's why a lot of directors don't allow the talent to come to dailies so that they won't worry about what they look like. And in those days, more, much more attention was paid to the female stars than is paid today. And by that, I don't mean that we slough off the star and don't try to make her look her best, because after all, that's just as important a part of the movie as anything else. But I think they overdid it in those days. I think there was a real uh, aura about the star that, that just absorbed the cameraman as well as the, the fans. And he would go to extra trouble and time. They would spend hours sometimes just lighting one close-up. And today, if we spend 15 minutes on a close-up, you know, we're, everybody's breathing down your neck. You know, what's taking so long? Um, I think, to me, uh, if the, the young picture maker will only be honest, be honest in what he writes, be honest in what he photographs, lighting-wise, directorial-wise and so forth, he'll make a, he should become a very successful picture maker. People that I have known and that I have learned from and that I've been associated with, and I could mention names to you now, like Mr. Lee Garms, Mr. Greg Tolan, Mr. George Barnes, Carl Struess, Hal Moore, Oliver Marsh many years ago, Tony Gordio. Uh, these are great, great cinematographers. And actually, what these men, oh yes, I mustn't forget one other person whom I'm sure that you know of, a man who has done so much for so many, for, you know, for so long, and he worked with Griffith many years ago, named Billy Bitzer, oh, yeah. the so-called father of cinematography. And uh, I don't think, and this applies not only to him, but I think it applies to, to the director and to the star, we'll say, of 30 or 40 years ago, when what they were doing, they did not realize, nor were they aware, that that which they were doing would become today a work of art. 